you have in front of you uh, a sort of a, a re rehashed or restructured set of notes for uh, lesson 123. The life and I've, I've sort of altered the title of these two. Uh, the life and ministry of C. Richard Jordan, the, the Bible Society years, 1979 to 1987. Last last Sunday, what we did is we came down and we didn't quite finish. You know, we left off with this discussion here about the right division chart that we, that we have to finish up. So what I did is I just took that section out of last week's notes and put it here at the beginning of this week's. So I know I told you to bring those other notes. What you have in front of you on uh, this week's notes is basically identical to uh, that section that we didn't cover last week, unless you know Sylvia may have made some uh, editorial changes or what have you. But um, it's essentially the exact same information. The other thing is uh, I did retitle when I when I sent it to Kirk to post on the internet. I did retitle last last study, and I I called it uh, the life and ministry of C. Richard Jordan, the formative years. Uh, 1962 to 1980. So I sort of didn't really like the title I was working with and uh, try, tried to rework that. So if you look at the introduction and review section, it says in the previous lesson we utilized the recording of my interview with Richard Jordan, <laughs> recorded on February, or I'm sorry, Friday, June 21st, 2013, to establish some key points about his <coughs> ministry. In Lesson 122, we covered the following general topics under the title of the formative years, 1962 to 1980. So what we looked at there was uh, his salvation and uh, early grace education, and his, what his relationships were, what he was reading, what he was studying, how he was uh, coming by the understanding of the Word of God rather divided. The second subject we looked at under that, that time period was the King James Bible how he came to his position and belief with respect to the King James Bible. Uh, you probably don't remember because it was a week ago, but I, I made mention of this uh, book by Glasson, is, I think is how you say it, and Craig said that I had the book and didn't know it, so I went home and looked for it, and sure enough, I did, I did have it the whole time. Uh, I did spend a little bit of time reading it this week, but uh, not as much as I would have maybe otherwise liked to have done. Uh, but we, we do have that book, and that book was formative, as well as uh, the J.J. Ray book, God Only Wrote One Book, as well as the uh, Bible Babble by Ruckman, as we went over last week. So we looked at uh, salvation and early grace education, we looked second at the King James Bible, and then we, the last thing that we covered was uh, the Pauline design for the edification of the believer, and how, how we came to understand and see the, uh, the pattern of edification of Paul's epistles, and uh, lay that out into a curriculum that would then be later taught uh, in Grace School of the Bible. So there was one subject from Jordan's formative period that we did not have time to touch on during the previous lesson, the subject of Jordan's dispensational chart and methodology for teaching uh, right division of the Bible. Now it's, it's sort of uh, advantageous in a way that we switch classrooms because there's a ready comparison on the board. If you look over here on the wall, there are, these are two of uh, Mr. O'Hare's most uh, prevalent charts that he created, of the many that he created. And I would submit to you that you could spend from now till next month looking at that and still not have a clue what in the world he's trying to say by those charts. Okay? The, the charts are highly complicated. They are not very easy to follow. And I've spent time looking at looking at him in the past and uh, really struggled to know exactly what he was trying to convey by some of them. That's a relief. Okay, so, um, but, Somebody else feels that. <laughs> unlike, unlike those charts, which are very complicated, very convoluted, hard to follow, uh, Richard came up with a, a methodology of teaching right division that was very simplistic and very easy to follow. So this would be the last point in this uh, formative uh, the formative years section. So the right division chart. One of the most influential aspects of Richard George's ministry has been his method of teaching dispensational truth according to the threefold division, time past, but now, and ages to come. This method is simpler and easier to grasp than more traditional methods such as test failure judgment dispensationalism. Early on, Roy Lange passed out a dispensational chart of the seven dispensations that he had gotten from Milwaukee Bible Institute while sitting under C.R. Stam. So uh, Jordan said that very shortly after he got saved and he was having his meetings with uh, Brother Lange and attending his church, he received a copy of a chart that Stam had actually passed out while uh, Roy Lange had been at the Milwaukee Bible Institute as a student 
sitting in Stan's class on dispensationalism. Uh, which, by the way, that chart was later, I believe, incorporated into things that differ, or if not, a very similar chart was added to, uh, to that book. So according to the interview, it was from reading Leon Tucker that Jer Jordan first saw the time pass but now and ages to come methodology of rightly dividing the word of truth. And I alluded to this at the end of uh, the, our time together last Sunday. Um, Leon Tucker does have in here... In his book uh, with him, uh, subtitled Studies in the Epistle to the Ephesians, he does discuss this idea of um, tracing the Gentiles' relationship to the Jews in terms of time past being the past, but now being the present, and the ages to come being a reference to the future. He, he talks about that a couple different places uh, within the book. But Richard said that he first was struck by sort of the simplicity, the simplicity of that methodology as he was reading this book by Leon Tucker. Um, so that, that's definitely a significant point to note that he, was fir he first sort of saw that uh, by, by reading that book. Richard said that in the late 60s and early 70s, the preachers in Alabama each had their own way of teaching dispensationalism. He said they all had their different nuanced ways of drawing out a chart and stuff like that when they would teach about the right, the right division, rightly dividing the word of truth. And he said that none of them, though, at least the guys he knew in Alabama, would ever teach dispensationalism using that test failure judgment model. He said that was not something that they were typically doing. So it was from reading Leon Tucker and bouncing ideas off Dr. Gruby and others that Richard developed his own method of teaching right division. So he is using this methodology um, all during his ministry in Alabama. He's sort of refining it, using it, and so on, and, 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 and described the situation as sort of very um, routine, if you will, uh, amongst the preachers in Alabama to be, to be teaching right division uh, you know, in a similar way, although not exactly identical to the way that he was doing it. So here you get point number three under this section. Uh, it was not until Richard came to Chicago that he realized, he actually said he was stunned, how powerful his method of teaching right division actually was. After coming to Chicago in 1979, in his early 30s, Richard taught the saints at North Shore Church the chart, and they were blown away with his simplicity. Um, I'll, I'll comment more on that in a second. And further, it was over the Thanksgiving weekend in 1980 that Richard was invited to preach to a group in Florida who were a part of Roscoe Kent's group. Uh, he described that as being somewhat of an interesting endeavor because they were a GGF-affiliated group, and at the time, Richard was working for Stam in the Brain Bible Society, so that was sort of an awkward... Uh, Inv invitation to start with, but he goes down there and he teaches basic right division using the time past but now ages to come chart. After preaching for about an hour and drawing the chart on the chalkboard, one pastor came up to him and told him that he had been preaching for four, preaching 40 years and never saw things put together in the manner that Jordan had just explained them. This man took pictures of it and took them to a sign, uh, should say, uh, pa yeah, sign painter to make a chart to put on the wall. So he was, I don't know if you've, if you've never seen old videos of him, te of him teach this, he starts with a board that's this blank. Well, as he's teaching it, he draws it out, and by the time he's done, the board is full of, of just scribbling, drawing, uh, verses, you know, you name it, he's, he's got the board com just completely jam-packed with as much information as he can fit on it. So this gentleman came up afterward and took pictures of it when he was done with all that stuff on it. And then he then took those to a, to a sign painter and had a, a, a wall chart painted up. And that was sort of the beginning origin of it being a wall chart. So if you look at the one that we have hanging in our uh, auditorium, the origin of that was from these early meetings here. Um, you look at, this is, a, this is what we're talking about. Uh, this, this, this chart right here, which has the capacity, as you know, if you, as most of you have seen it, to fold out and reveal the mystery. Okay? So this is, the, this is the chart we're talking about. And it was not originally this sort of refined. It was, it was a process of refining that got this chart down to 
uh, the way that we sort of recognize it today. The, the next point, late in the 1980s, some men in San, some men in San Juan Capistrano, California, built Richard Jordan a chart made out of plywood. And he, he said that this thing weighed over 100 pounds. They surprised him with it. He flew out there for a conference, and these men in the, in, in the year between the last time he was there and when he came back out the next, the next year, they had taken plywood and built a chart and set it up on stands in the front and surprised him with it. And he said the thing weighed like over 100 pounds. It's, it's just, you know, a massive... A massive chart, but it was a representation of you know what he had been drawing on the chalkboard, um, and it, like I said, it was it was from that plywood chart then that this fold-out chart was born. Okay, John. Let, let me say what, he said that what was unique about that first plywood chart is that it had a hinge on it, and so when the when the men built it, they built it with a hinge. Now imagine this made out of plywood. They build it with a hinge so when you opened it here, you would reveal the mystery and you could close it here and study the prophetic program without, you know, uh, with the mystery still hidden as it were, okay? So it was, it was this plywood chart that the men in California built that could open up on this hinge, Jordan said, that was the origin of this printed chart and later the more corrugated plastic wall chart that they sell today, okay? But the point here is this, this methodology of teaching right division was so simple and so easy to follow that it became, people that had been in right division studying dispensational theology for years found it to be so, such a tool that there were people all over helping him refine that into, uh, into the current forms that we know it today. John Westmus, now I'm going to top page two. My Sunday school uh, teacher during high school in Genoa City, Wisconsin, made the first color separation uh, on the chart between their prophetic and mystery program. John Westmus, who was my high school uh, Sunday school teacher at Brian, uh, Brian Grace Church in Genoa City, Wisconsin, is a, uh, a professional art, art uh, graphic designer. And what he was, what he did. Is you open this up, you see that different yellow color. What he did is separate out the color schemes to clearly delineate between what's mystery or Pauline information and what's prophetic uh, or uh, information related to the nation of Israel. So this chart started in sort of rudimentary form in Leon Tucker's book. The scheme was picked up on by Richard. Richard refined it, began teaching it all over the country, drawing it on chalkboards. The people found it to be so um, useful to them that they took the initiative to take that idea and turn it into teaching tools. And he said that he never even had the he never even had the idea to do stuff like make these charts and put it on a wall chart, and that all of that is largely the uh, the brainchild of people that were. Um, Benefiting and appreciating uh, what they were getting from that method of from that method of study. Um, so throughout the eight, uh, throughout the 1980s and 90s, at all the conferences George George spoke at, Friday night was de was designated as chart night. Richard would teach the chart to introduce the weekend's topic by going over the basics of rightly dividing the word of truth. So what he would do Friday night is he would teach the chart, and then from there he would use that as a, as a, uh, a point of origin to identify, okay, here, what we're going to be talking about specifically this weekend. And then he would use that as a, a way to, uh, you know, get the weekend's meetings underway and, and focus people's attention on what exactly they were studying. And so he goes all, all throughout the 80s and 90s going around the country doing this at these regional weekend Bible conferences. And it's through that that this refining process is, is occurring with the materials related to that methodology of teaching uh, right division. Um, one last thing, he said that, and we're going to see this point a little bit clearer here in a moment, but he said that when he was first asked 
Um, and it was first evident that the saints at the North Shore Church wanted Richard to be their regular teacher. That he start he started with them by teaching the chart, and he said, "Look, if you're going to understand what I'm going to be teaching you, you have to understand the basis of the premise from which I'm going to be working." And so he taught that first, and from there, the saints at North Shore said that they had never never seen presentation of right division so clearly since the time of O'Hare. So this is all kind of happening. Um, the, the, the materials are being, multiple people around the country are doing different things, turning it into different uh, study materials and aids, which lead to things like this that I have here, the one that's on the wall uh, in, our, in our auditorium. So any, any questions about that point? It's important that you understand, though, that this, this, this method is one of the key distinctive features of his ministry. Okay, this, this, way of, this way of teaching um, right division. And then he went around and he taught hundreds of people to rightly divide the word of truth using that, using that simple method. Okay, so, next point, heading north, the move to Chicago. George's decision to move to Chicago was initiated by an invitation to work for Pastor Stam at the Brean Bible Society. So what, what prompts him to leave Alabama and move north is Stam asks him to come work at the Bible Society. Jordan met Stam in the early 1960s, shortly after he got saved through his relationship with Roy Lange. When Jordan started pastoring in Selma, he corresponded with Stam and used a lot of the Brain Bible Society's material in his ministry. So he meets very early on in his Christian life, he meets Mr. Stam. He once, he once he gets into a church of his own, he starts pastoring and is, is in a, you know, regular ministry leading the church. He has correspondence with Stam and he is using the materials that the Bible Society is producing there in the ministry at, uh, in, in Selma. So that's, how he, that's sort of the background on how he knows Stam. It was in response to a letter that Richard sent to Stam asking a question about one of Stam's former associates that the conversation of moving to Chicago and working for the Brain Bible Society first came up. So the way Richard explained it was he had written Mr. Stam a question about an individual and Stam thought it important enough to call him with his answer. So he calls Richard while, while uh, on the phone and talks to him and it was in that conversation that the idea or the, uh, the, the first floating of the idea for him to come and work with Stam was first uh, you know, put forth. Stam was looking for someone to take the work, workload off of himself so that he could write more. According to Richard, the whole reason why, uh, and you'll see that I believe Stam's going to corroborate this in a moment, the whole reason why this is the, the, the idea and the plan is by this point, Stam is aging, you know, he's, he's aging a little bit, and he wants to write commentaries. And so the plan is to bring somebody else on to sort of manage the daily running and administration of the Bible Society, thereby freeing Mr. Stam up to write and, and, and so forth. So in the summer of 1979, Richard moved his family north to begin assisting Stam in the work at the Brain Bible Society. From Stam, Richard learned two primary skills, he says. Number one, he developed as a writer. He said Stam was very exacting and all the communication had to be on memos. Everything had to be written out or typed out on memos. And uh, Richard said what that taught him was to be very careful with the words he chose because Stan would call him on stuff if he used the wrong word or used the word in a wrong uh, context or usage or whatever. But he said that, that taught him, watching Stan do his thing with the searchlight, taught him how to become a better writer. And he also said that he learned the philosophy and the process of how to lay out and organize a magazine. Uh, as a result of working with Mr. Stam. In the news and announcements section of the November 1979 issue of the Brain and Searchlight, we find the following statement, quote, Pastor Richard Jordan began his ministry at the Brain Bible Society on July 1st. 
Special contributions toward his support will, will be deeply appreciated at this time. So there's an official announcement in the searchlight in November of 79 that he is on, on board and working at the, at the Marine Bio Society. So, any questions? Mike? Back, back to the chart. Uh, I, the Brilliant Bible Society doesn't use that approach at all today. Um, uh, is this copyrighted material or is, is it they just don't? Uh, do you have an opinion on that? Or I don't know if it's it? copyrighted per se, but it's within gray circles, it's commonly known that whose method. Of teaching. They still use seven times a failure type approach. Yeah, they do. I, I, I did see about 10 years ago a chart came out that was somewhat similar to this one. Oh, okay. uh, I will look through my stuff at home because I think I still have it. And if I do, I'll bring it in next week. But this is when, when Richard moved on from the Bible Society, this method basically he took with him. And I think the, the Bible Society, in a, method, in, a, in a decided effort to distance themselves from him, didn't retain it when, when he was no longer the president. So upon arriving in Chicago, the Jordan family had not yet located a suitable home. So they leave, and that by this time now, they, I believe they have at least two children, possibly three. Uh, they have three boys. And they leave to come to Chicago, and they don't yet have a suitable home. So the saints at the North Shore Church, O'Hare's old church, offered to let the Jordan family temporarily live in their parsonage, since they were currently without a pastor. So this is how the relationship with the North Shore Church starts. Jordan arrives in Chicago without a, without a home for his family. Stam... The weekend prior to Richard's arrival in Chicago had preached and filled the pulpit at North Shore. So when Jordan shows up, Stam says, the saints at North Shore are uh, willing to let you reside for at least for now temporarily in their parsonage. And so that's, that's what they did. At the time, North Shore was in the midst of a pastoral search and was having preachers come in for two-week intervals to fill their pulpit. There were two open slots that Jordan agreed to fill in September 1979. So this is not long after they've arrived. After those two weeks, the men of the church told him that they wanted him to preach every Sunday and to let them know the weeks that he could not be there. So the idea, so they they so enjoyed his preaching in, the, in that two-week interval that he agreed to fill that basically what they say is we don't we don't really want anybody else. You tell us when you're not going to be here. Other than that, you know, we're going to we're going to count on you or be expecting that you're going to preach if you agree to it, which he which he did. But it wasn't quite so simple. So look at the next point. Because of a Green Bible Society policy, Jordan could not be employed by anyone else. Stan would not allow him to work for anyone else if he was an employee of the Bible Society. After unsuccessfully asking Stam to relax his policy, the saints at North Shore, whom Stam had previously pastored, designated Richard Jordan their official pulpit pastor, which was an official unpaid position. <laughs> so they sort of get around this. Now, I want to be clear about this point. It was the North Shore saints that went to Stam to ask Stam if, if he would allow Richard to do this. He was very standoffish about it and, and didn't really want to allow it. And uh, I should probably mention that Stam in the 60s for a time had been the pastor at North Shore for a while. And according to uh, what I was told, that did not necessarily end very well. When he stepped down or did not, uh, or was no longer the pastor at North Shore. So now the North Shore Saints are going to stand the president of the Bible Society who Richard works for and saying, look, we want this guy to preach for us. And he basically tells them no. And so they get around it by making him and giving him sort of an official unpaid position. So I'm just reporting what happened here, okay? At first, Jordan did, Jordan did not join the church because of their official affiliation with the GGF. 
Jordan told the board that if they would leave Grand Rapids in Grand Rapids, he would let Belmont Avenue be Belmont Avenue, and they could work together. So Jordan and his family joined the North Shore Church with the understanding that they were not also joining the GGF. Okay? Any questions about any of that? Yeah? Did, is there any notation as to why Stan had that policy of not working anywhere else? Um, I can sort of, and I'm going to preface this by saying surmise a few things by reading between the lines a little bit. I think Stan was fiercely um, he did not want people, he did not want there to be a perception that people had divided loyalties. And so I think his his you know, predispositions towards this may have something to do with that and the fact that Stam himself did not regularly attend a local assembly. No. No, he did not. I've heard that from Lee, I've heard that from Richard, I've heard that from multiple sources. Was there any reason? I, the exact reason I couldn't say other than the fact that he didn't do it. When he attended church, he usually attended the Baptist church. That's that's not the first person that's told me that. Okay. So that's a little bit of possibly answer your question there, Tom. So we're on top of page three, right? So according to Jordan, it was the women at North Shore who helped his wife transition to living in Chicago. Stan never liked the idea that Richard was so heavily involved at North Shore. In fact, on one occasion, Stan brought it before the Brian Bible Society board that Richard was, quote, in church too much. <laughs> when the board told Stan that, Richard, that, that uh, Richard Jordan should be in church on account of his family, Stan finally dropped the issue. So what happens is there's some guys on the board that have families, kids, so forth, and they're like, Look, the guy's, he, he's got a family to eat. He should be in church. That's, he needs to take his family to church and, and so on. And he sort of uh, dropped the issue, apparently. The following statement, written by Stam, appeared in the June 1980 issue of the Brain Searchlight under the title Special Announcement by the Editor. Quote, Beloved friends of Brain Bible Society, at our most recent Board of Directors meeting, April 26, 1980, it was unanimously agreed that we invite our beloved brother, Richard Jordan, to become the Executive Director of Marine Bible Society, effective immediately. Brother Jordan has accepted this responsibility. Since coming to the Marine Bible Society last July, Brother Jordan has proved a great blessing to us all and to me personally. He is truly dedicated to God and to the blessed truth uh, for which we stand. I can, hardly, I can hardly say of him, as Paul said of Timothy, as a son with his father, he served, he served with me in the gospel. And this attitude, we believe, has, been, uh, has enabled him already to learn much about the really important aspects of the ministries of Brain Bible Society. I will remain as president of Brain Bible Society and chairman of its board of directors. But with Brother Jordan taking on more administrative responsibilities, now here it is, I, I will, God willing, be able to give more time to studying and writing on Paul's epistles, the most exacting project I have ever undertaken. So there you go. There's the execution of what the plan was from the beginning. Richard is going to move to Chicago. There's going to be some sort of a time frame of, you know, Initiation, for lack of a better term, and I don't mean that in the negative sense of the word initiation, but a, a uh, you know, an intern, uh, internship's not quite right either, but a, a trial period where he's going to learn things, and once he's demonstrated that he can handle or, or, or uh, you know, run the ministry the way that it, it's needed, Sam then is going to step back from that daily administration of the ministry so that he can focus his attention on writing these commentaries on the Pauline epistles. And that was the goal from the beginning. Okay, uh, that was the goal from the beginning of bringing Richard up to Chicago and having him be a part of uh, of the ministry of the society, Bible Society. So, any questions there?
By the end of Jordan's tenure at the Bible Society, he had progressed from the position of editor to the sorry to the position of editor of the Searchlight. He was made editor in 1986. At the time, being the editor of the Searchlight meant that Jordan ran the ministry. The way Richard described it at the time, the way Sam had structured things, whoever was the editor of the magazine was basically the one that was in charge of the entire ministry. So by making Jordan the editor, Stan has now officially sort of removed himself from any of the official day-to-day -day functioning, operating, and so forth, of the mag of not just of the Bible Society, but now also of the Brain Searchlight magazine itself. So let's finish that point. At the time, being editor of the Searchlight meant that Jordan ran the ministry. Stan had no official responsibilities and was freed up entirely to write. Richard said at the time he became the editor, he resisted it because he had come to the conclusion that he was not going to be staying forever. So by the time 1986 rolls around <coughs> and Stan says it's time, Richard says that he had already was already coming to the realization that this wasn't going to last forever and he wasn't going to stay there forever regardless of whatever was going to happen next that he didn't know was going to happen next but he, he knew that it, the, the bottom line is when Stan comes to him and says hey it's time for you to be the editor he had reservations he said to me in the interview that he expressed those reservations to Stan but he agreed to try it and, and take it on for a while and, and see, see what happened and how it went Jordan was adamant that Stan knew where he stood on the King James Bible when he offered him a job at Brain Bible Society in 1979. This, of course, meant that Stan was clear where Jordan stood on the Bible issue when he offered him the editor editorship of the Searchlight in 1986, despite his later claims to the contrary. Now listen, I know this is going to be a disputed point, particularly on the side of the Bible Society. I, Richard said that he would not have taken the job if Stan did not know and understand, or at least know, where he stood on that issue. Because he had already formulated an opinion and had a position on it for at least 10 years, give or take, before he even moved to Chicago. So any claims on the part of Stan later on to know, to have not known what Richard was, where he was on that issue, Richard says would have been false. Okay? So take comment on that in a minute. Um, other areas of disagreement between Stan and Jordan included whether or not the twelve apostles were members of the body of Christ and who wrote Hebrews. He described it, folks, as this. He said he had a clipboard that he carried around with him that had 13 statements on it. And these were the 13 statements he said that he and Mr. Stan would go round and round and round about. And he said at the top of the list was the King James Bible. Second on the list was were the twelve in or, in or out of the body of Christ. Third on the list was who wrote Hebrews, and then he didn't tell me what the rest of them were. Okay, but he said he would carry this around with him, and they would go as as they were going around doing their thing and so forth in the society. They would be discussing these things both orally and via memo. And he said that there is no way that Sam didn't know where he stood on the Bible when he hired him, and that he would not have taken the position there had that question not been discussed. Now he did say Stan never agreed with him about it, but he was willing to work on it. That's the way you put it, to hopefully one day persuade him to see it his way. Pastor, yeah. what exactly was the dispute on that? Can I hold off on answering that question until sure. next week? Sure. Because we're going to get into we're going to get into that question. Because that that's one of the key issues then that is going to leave lead to Richard resigning if you listen to him or him being relieved if you listen to Stan. Okay. Okay. Any comments here before we hit page four? Yeah. Well, am I jumping the gun then also because that little article I gave that you asked for? Could have been written by Mr. Stan himself. There's nothing, um, and that was written in November of '86. 
I'm going to touch on this. There's a very specific reason why, why I asked for that issue. Oh, okay. okay. I have in my possession that I've come by a letter that Stam sent to the board of directors of the Brain Bible Society that references an article that Richard wrote in the November 1986 issue of the Brain Searchlight where he was supposedly clearing the air. Okay. Um, this particular article that I asked you for caused a stir even amongst Richard's uh, students in the Grace School of the Bible because they felt like he was stepping back from what he taught them for the purposes of maintaining his position. Okay, so I did understand so the article, right? there is a bit of a controversy uh, and, and again my intent here is to be as fair as possible in, in presenting what happened. Sure. So your perception about that article without that background information is, is probably what you would you would think possibly. Okay. okay. Mike? What version of the Bible was Mr. Stam? Stam used the King James Bible. Yeah. Okay. But Stam the thing that would but Stam would also not hesitate to say things like a better translation of this is thus and so. Richard objects to that. Okay, um, he 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 would not he view that as appropriate because he thinks it undermines people's confidence in the Bible that they have. If it can just be, you know, corrected and so forth, you know, at whim by whoever decides that it needs to be corrected. So that's a short answer to your question. Uh, I happened to, uh, during that time, about 1979, 80, uh, during that time that he was pastoring or helping at North Shore, and he was trying to make up his mind to go with Stan, uh, Brother Jordan and uh, a couple other people, uh, Pastor Barry and uh, Paul Franzen from the North Shore Church, came and visited with me, and they stayed overnight for a couple of days. And at that time, I was a real strong uh, supporter of the King James Only. Uh, I was pretty much a follower of Otis Ford uh, here in town. And, uh, I can remember some of those things, but he was concerned about coming with Stamp because of that issue. He didn't know whether it'd be compatible, but I also remember later on when the, the controversy boiled, uh, uh, Richard did, I think mistakenly, wrote an article in support of sort of backing away from that, and I happen to have uh, some of those articles. That's that the article I was just talking to Mike about. Yeah. And that's interesting because, and I don't think we ought to look at it as a flaw because uh, we all, if anybody has not changed their mind on issues, and if you don't wrestle with it, uh, you're, not, you're not normal. Uh, my personal opinion is that I'm a little fearful of people who give a, a blanket uh, stamp of approval to something. I still always have some areas of my theology open, <laughs> somewhat tentative, and I think Jordan did the same thing. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not critical of either one, but I can understand the controversy over that. And uh, part of the thing was, whether that's true or not, I do know that Jordan did not compromise what he believed about the King James as he traveled. But in print, it looked like he was. And that was the, my, that, the, and that right there was the bone of contention because there are men that are still alive that were students of Jordan's in the school, a pastoral training class at the time, that felt like that article in the searchlight was him hedging on what he had taught them in their school classes about that issue and took offense to it. Um, I, I know that personally because my dad is friends with a couple of them still that were, you know, uh, associates. My dad graduated from the video school in 1987 or 1988. And so he knows a lot of these uh, guys personally. They're, they're colleagues of him that were to, would have been around um, when a lot of this, uh, this hullabaloo was beginning to, to, to break out in the latter half of the 1980s. Um, so which point do we leave off on? Top of page four? 
Jordan said that he had two opportunities to leave the Brain Bible Society and go other places, but that the thing that kept him in Chicago was the people from the North Shore Church. O'Hare's son, Robert, told Richard that he was more like his dad than anyone who had passed at the church since his father's death in 1958. No one had spoken about the little flock in North Shore Church since O'Hare died. Uh, when Richard's teaching about right to vision and he draws his little chart illustrating how the little flock works, uh, he said somebody came up to him afterwards and said, nobody's spoken a word about the little flock in this church since O'Hare died. So the way Richard's very simplistic methodologies of teaching right to vision endeared himself to the saints at, Sh at North Shore and them to, uh, to him. Robert O'Hare's son here, Richard described him as sort of the, uh, I don't know, do you know him, Lee? You know Robert O'Hare? No. Okay. He sort of described him as the odd duck of the family. Um, you know, the, the guy that was sort of the one of the one of O'Hare's children that was sort of um, not always, you know, every family has that guy, right? The one that sort of goes a different way and, and that sort of thing. So he, he viewed that this that he made this statement to him about his dad as uh, quite a quite a compliment coming from him. And he said it he said as the best he said as the most it was the best compliment anybody ever gave him in his life to say that he, that, uh, he reminded them and the saints there of, of J.C. O'Hare. Jordan said that it marveled him how O'Hare still lived in the people, even after being dead for 20 years. In Richard's estimation, the true legacy of O'Hare was the people of the North Shore Church remained faithful to the grace message after so many years. He said that he has never seen... In, in his entire life, a, a um, man survive, a man's ministry survive and live on in the lives of the people that he ministered to, like he encountered when he first came to Chicago and met these saints uh, at, at this assembly. Uh, so that's that, that's just a you know a high praise and compliment uh, for for that aspect of things. Moving on, then, any questions there? The merger, the formation of Shorewood Bible Church. The saints at North Shore did not want to leave their building on the corner of Wilson and Sheridan Roads. And I think I might have got that wrong. I think it might be Belmont. I, I gotta double check that directions. It was when Franklin Anderson, an elder in the church, said in a board meeting that he could not keep up the building anymore, that the saints knew they were going to have to leave their historic location. Now you got, this, is a, this is an aging group. They, these are guys that had been with O'Hare all the way back to before he died. So O'Hare died in 58. It's now late 70s, early 80s. And this group that had been with O'Hare uh, more than 20 years previous is now aged 20 years. And as getting to a point where managing this building was, was no longer feasible for them. And they, they wanted to stay. Richard said, as soon as Franklin Anderson stood up and said, I can't handle this anymore, they knew they had to leave. In other words, if Franklin couldn't do it, said it was too much, then it was too much. And there was just sort of no question about it. This is what has to happen. Even though they didn't necessarily want that to be the case. At the time, the top priority of this aging congregation of 60 to 80 people was to make sure they stayed together. They did not want to sell the church and then be dispersed into you know four or five other churches they wanted to remain together as a local assembly even if they could not remain in their historic church building don ellison pastor of norwood bible church and one time professor at grace bible college told the saints at north shore that they should come and join them in their ministry so when it becomes clear that they cannot stay anymore in that facility and they're going to have to do something. Allison comes from North Shore or from uh, Norwood and says, "Hey, listen, why don't you guys just why don't you come over and join us and so on?" Jordan said that. Uh, let's see. Jordan said that initially. That initially. That's not the right word I want. Jordan. Jordan said that initially there was some bad blood. Initially there was some bad blood. Okay, between some of the saints from North Shore and Ellison. In addition, let me comment about that sentence first. Apparently what happened is 
Um, a young man from North Shore married a young lady from Norwood, Ellison's church, and went to Mexico as missionaries. And for whatever reason, I don't know all of the details, this, this, this man's wife died while they were in Mexico. And when he came back, there were some folks associated with Ellison's church that blamed this guy from North Shore for um, working her to death or somehow, they're not blaming him for killing her or anything like that, but they're blaming him for somehow his treatment of her leading to these events and so on and so forth. And so there was, so, there was some bad blood between some of the families here over this event that had happened at some point previous. Okay? So when the idea comes up, hey, let's merge, when, when Ellison comes to the, the North Shore Saints and say, hey, let's merge, there's an immediate sort of, no, we don't want to do that over whatever this, the details of this event were in the past. The other reason, in addition, Ellison's health was failing at the time, and the North Shore Saints did not want to, quote, go watch another pastor die. So they did not want any part of going and joining themselves to a church, to, to you know, to, to a congregation of believers, and immediately have to sit, stand there and you know, sit there and watch another pastor die. They, they'd been through that with O'Hare, and they, they didn't really want to do that again. So those are the two major issues that were the roadblocks, the initial roadblocks to a merger between North Shore Church and Norwood Bible Church. The North Shore Church building was sold for $301,000 to a Southern Baptist ministry. They made offers of $300,000 on buildings all around the Chicagoland area but were unable to immediately secure a new building. Richard said that they made a standing offer on every building, $300,000. They made that offer on million dollar buildings, $900,000 buildings, $800,000 buildings. That was their offer and nobody took them up on it. So they remained buildingless, if you will. The first year after the building was sold, they met with Pastor Dennis Kizonis and the Saints of Lockwood Bible Church in Chicago, a little further west of their original location. Originally, before Kizonis left to pastor preach this Bible church in New Jersey, there was some talk of merging with Lockwood Bible. However, for various reasons, after the departure of Kizonis, it became apparent that a merger there was not going to work. So that, that, that uh, arrangement wasn't going to work for various reasons. I don't know what they were totally, yes. So what time is this year-wise, and what is Pastor Jordan doing? This is, uh, that's a good question. Look at top page five. This is all happening in the early 80s. So Richard is still working for Stan. Okay. So the, the selling of the building, the eventual merger, this is, this is happening <coughs> over about a year and a half between sometime in, in 1980 through 1981 into 1982. And is he's, he, so he's not the unofficial unpaid pastor anymore? He's still preaching in some capacity. Um, even as they're trying to work out this merger situation, but that's a great, good question. I can't answer that specifically. I know, though, obviously that whole time he is still working with and for Mr. Stan. At what point did uh, Ernie Green fit in there? He was, he was pastor there for a while sometime during that, either before Jordan or maybe after, maybe during these talks of selling the building. I don't remember. But Ernie Green was the pastor there for a while. Which, where? At North Shore. Uh, I think that would be before this, because once once Jordan once Jordan started preaching, he never he saw them through the sale of the building, the transferring of the congregation, and the eventual merging with Norwood. I was there with uh, Ernie when he was pastor, so I think Jordan must have followed. I think that's the succession. Yes. So um, bottom of page four. So. While they're trying to see if it'll work with Lockwood Bible, bottom of page four, in the meantime, Don Ellison of Norwood Bible Church passed away. Okay? So that, that barrier to them merging with Nor the Norwood Saints is gone. Okay? Ellison, Ellison passed away, uh, Richard said, sometime in about 1981. 
uh, he, he uh, surmised, and as a result of that, that, that barrier to that, so those, those two congregations getting together is gone. One evening prior to a meeting of the North Shore Board, two men from the Norwood Board came and said that they needed to join them or they were going to close their doors. So after the death of Ellison, the way I understand this is things got pretty tight and dire over at the Norwood Church. And so two of the representatives of their board come over and basically say to the um, North Shore Saints, look, if you guys don't come over here, we're going to have to close. Okay. Now that tells you something else. That tells you that even though they didn't have a church, did those saints from North Shore continue to function as a church and have a board? Mm -hmm. they, they, still, they, they still said, we are, this is our group. And they never lost that identity throughout this entire process. So the boards of the two churches met and decided that their congregations would meet together for one year at the end of which they would vote to decide if they would merge together. The men on the boards were having a hard, were having a hard time getting along with one another, and Jordan said it was through the pulpit ministry and the preaching of the Word that the congregation began gelling together. Now this, this is his estimation. At the time, Norwood Bible practiced the Lord's Supper every month. Jordan said that he used those services to teach about the oneness of the body in Christ, and that it was through those services that the two congregations began to view themselves as one body. Jordan said he used those services to rebuke the spirit of division that he saw within the two different congregations. He would say, if he were here, I think that he is convinced that that played a large part in taking these two groups of, of saints and beginning to get them to view themselves as one body together as a local church this during this time frame. And so Richard is doing all of the preaching uh, to answer some of your question, uh, Tom. So top of page 5, in 1982, while in the, uh, well into the process, there was a meeting to discuss the merger. The biggest sticking point became that the Norwood portion of the board wanted to pay Mrs. Ellison a pension, and the North Shore members did not. Okay. The North Shore people responded by stating that they never paid Mrs. O'Hare a pension, to which the Norwood crowd said, shame on you, <laughs> according to Jordan. Okay. Um, so to resolve the impasse, it was agreed upon by the boards that Mrs. Ellison would be paid a pension of $15,000 from what was left from the Norwood funds. So this is how they get around this. So the funds that the Norwood Church had left over from their uh, dealings and so forth from previous, uh, from their, their congregation, those funds then were designated to be the ones that would be given to um, Mrs., Mrs. Ellison for this pension. Um, when the North Shore contingent balked at paying Mrs. Ellison a pension because she had not been to church in over a year since her husband died, Jordan scolded them and told them that it was inappropriate to hold that against her. Uh, Richard said, he was pretty, pretty adamant, that he said when, it, when it got to this point, he stepped in and said, listen, have you ever been the, he used the illustration of his, his uncle, remember his uncle had been the pastor of a Baptist church. When his uncle died, his aunt tried to go to that church for a period of time after his uncle died and just came to the realization that she couldn't because every Sunday that music would start and she'd wait for him to walk in and he never, and he never came and she'd you know, worry, where is he? And it just was, it was too emotionally taxing for her to do that. And so Richard basically rebuked these, uh, these, North, these North Shore saints for unfairly uh, dealing with Mrs. Ellison in this way, um, and they let it go, voted, and decided to merge. So let's just finish the point. Um, with this roadblock behind them, both congregations voted to merge and became Shorewood Bible Church. So you can see where that name's coming from now. Okay, Shore from the North Shore group, Wood from the Norwood group. They stuck them together and became Shorewood Bible Church, uh, thereby 
maintaining at least a tie back to their original, uh, original identities. So over the next couple of months, new people started coming. One of them was Chuck Wilcher and his family and Sherry Hogan, who's now Sherry Kurz, married to Alex Kurz, and became the first Shorewood people. It was this combination of the pulpit preaching and new growth that led to the forging of a singular identity as a congregation. So there's, that's the dynamic. They, 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 they become Shorewood. New people come. They don't know anything about Norwood and North Shore. They just know this is, this is where we want to go to church. And over time, that folds itself into the existence of a singular unified congregation under the title, under the name Shorewood, that has its roots in these two separate churches that existed uh, prior to the 1980s. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned a moment ago, I'm backing up just a bit, that there were three things that were constant uh, issues of the King James, um, you mentioned the other, uh, uh, the Book of Hebrews. Yeah, and the uh, 12 and Crown. What about the issue, now I know, uh, I know, uh, all of those people, the old timers, were basically Calvinists. They were. Was that ever a tension there? Because uh, they, uh, even though they embraced a dispensational theology down at the at the foundation, they are still Christian reformers, or they're still very Calvinistic. Was that ever? Because I know Richard's uh, anti-Calvinist, as I am. Richard is. You are correct. Richard is very much anti-Calvinistic. He did, to whatever degree, Lee, that was a pattern or a problem, he did not say in this conversation. John, John, Don Ellison, they used to call him, his nickname was, they used to call him John Kelvin, because he was so Calvinistic. The interesting thing about him, just a comment about Don, what a wonderful man, though he was strong Calvinistic, he was the one guy that I recall would be out on the street corner passing out gospel tracts and witnessing to people individually and trying to get them to trust Christ, which of course is, seems to be contradictory to strong Calvinistic theology. But anyway, that's just a, a passing point that they were able to work together anyway. But. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a fair point, and again, to whatever degree the Calvinistic... Now remember, Stan came out of Dutch Reform yes. you know, background, and I would argue never left some of it. Uh, brought it with him into his, into his grace uh, you know, grace understandings, and uh, in fact, I would also argue that that all that holdover stuff from that Dutch Reformed background is going to really is going to really play a part in the controversies in the middle of the 1980s, because when it comes to the issue of First John 1 9, and it comes to the issue of some of these things about how God works in time and so on and so forth that are going to factor in just as much into Stam and Richard parting company with one another as much as the Bible, this whole this, this traditionalism that Stam had from his days in the Dutch Reformed Church that he sort of brought with him into his grace understanding and never, never let go of is, is eventually going to be an issue. Now, I, at, the, at the time that we're discussing now, he never said whether or not Calvinism was one of those 13 points on that clipboard or not. I think based on what Lee's saying, it's probably fairly educated guess to think that it was. Although to be fair, he didn't say that it was. Okay. All right, so yet again, we, oh, Mike, go ahead. I, I, just so we're clear, um, and for, for those listening to the, to the tape, uh, he was not Armenian either. No. And, and he would have been a, a modified <coughs> Calvinist from that. So the Calvinists that are listening to this need to understand that uh, he takes a, a, a position that's more more in the middle uh, and uh, would not identify with either group, but what he would say a biblical approach to. And you're and for, just for the record, yeah. you're referring to Richard Jordan, Richard Jordan, not Stan. Stan. Was, well, Stan. Stan. Stan would be a modified Calvinist. Yeah. Stan Richard was would never, never call himself that. Richard did a series of tapes, uh, studies at a conference in Tennessee in the 90s, and the title of the conference was um, something like Dispens 
dispensationalism versus Calvinism or something like that. And I mean, he he went through in seven nights and taught every night on um, on the tulip on dispensational theology and try to demonstrate that eventually those two systems of thought, Calvinism and dispensationalism, are going to be oppositional to one another and you are going to have to choose which one you're going to be. Are you going to be a dispensationalist or are you going to be a Calvinist? Because if you're going to be consistent, those two systems of thought are not going to work together. That was the way he explained it in that series of tapes that he did in, uh, in Tennessee in the 1990s. So. All these, all these points are definitely true and definitely factoring into um, what think, ultimately becomes the tensions here. I think the way those tensions are normally solved is uh, there are many who identify themselves as Calvinists, but they refuse, like uh, Don Ellison would have been a five-point Calvinist, and many of the Cal Calvinists at Grace Bible College would be five-point. But most of them, even today, will be, they'll call themselves a four-point three-point uh, kind of thing. And just one comment on that. The, the Lawrence Vance's book, The Other Side of Calvinism, is in my, if you can stomach reading the whole thing, um, he basically says, look, Calvinism is a superstructure that's held up by five pillars. And if you knock any one of them out, the whole thing is going to fall apart because each pillar is based on the others. Okay, but we, don't, we obviously don't have time to get into all that. Okay, but so we did not cover the uh, page five, Great School of the Bible yet. And so I'm going to do the same thing I did last time. I'm going to take this section, I'm going to stick it at the top of next week's notes, and we will pick up class next week by talking about Great School of the Bible. Okay? Any questions? All right, thanks for your attention.